His biography is in your programs. If you don't have one, they're outside. Dr. Adi Dirazari is new at the hospital, and he can tell you a little bit about his background when he gets up here. Tony's going to speak first. If you have any questions, please write them on a pad and hand them to me so we can screen them and present them in some kind of good order. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bright. Um, just, make, just do me one favor. Sure. Want, just make sure you're on the screen there. Oh, oh. Cool. Take a selfie. You got a selfie on that. Gotcha. Just let me know. Um, I want to start off by first uh, thanking Dr. Bright for inviting me here today. Um, this is the second time being here. It's a real pleasure uh, being here talking to everyone. Uh, although, you know, next time I request that if, I, if I'm fortunate to come back, I want to come back in the spring because the first time I talked here, <laughs> there was a big snowstorm. So now it's a big rainstorm. Next time I want just uh, sun and, uh, and nice weather. So um, I also want to thank everyone here to, to coming here tonight. I know it's the weather's not the greatest outside, but I really appreciate you coming in to listen to us talk. Um, today, the to topic today is going to be uh, total joint replacements. Um, it's a very broad topic, so I'm going to focus in a little bit about uh, uh, on knee replacements, and particularly in treating osteoarthritis of the knee. Before we can talk about arthritis in the knee, we need to sort of go back to the basics a little bit. You know, talk a little bit about the knee joint itself. Uh, the knee joint is a very, relatively simplistic joint. Uh, it's made up of uh, three main bones, the thigh bone, which is the femur, the leg bone, which is the tibia, and the kneecap bone, which is the patella. Uh, within the knee joint, there are actually three compartments. There's the medial compartment, which is the inner part of your knee joint, the outer compartment, which is the outer part of your knee joint, and then the patellofemoral compartment, which is the kneecap uh, compartment, which, although it's not a big portion of the knee joint, it's a very, it, it can cause a significant amount of problems in, in patients. <coughs> so what exactly is arthritis? Um, you, hear about, you hear this term all the time, but what exactly is it? Uh, arthritis is when the cartilage layer that covers the ends of the bone gets worn away. Um, when that gets worn away sufficiently uh, enough, and starts to cause problems. That's the underlying sort of problem here is the cartilage is worn down. And when that happens, uh, people develop bone spurs, people develop joint space narrowing, um, and they develop problems associated with uh, the loss of the cartilage. With everything in, in medicine, there's always a spectrum. So if you, if you actually look at the cartilage through a fiber optic camera, um, you can see the whole gradation of, of how the cartilage starts to wear away. In its mildest form, the cartilage becomes soft. Um, in its most severe form, when the cartilage is completely gone, you have it worn down to the actual bone itself. The symptoms of arthritis, I'm sure people can uh, throw out a few. Uh, mostly it's, it can be pain, uh, especially with ambulation, going up and down stairs, walking for long periods of time. Uh, it can be associated with stiffness, especially morning stiffness. Uh, it can be associated with swelling. People can go through episodes where their knee kind of swells up for no apparent reason. Uh, people can complain of catching or clicking if they have like a bone spur or a loose body associated with arthritis. Um, night pain is a big problem people complain about, whether it's hard to go to sleep or actually pain that wakes them up from sleep, uh, as well as uh, deformity. Because uh, And we'll start to explain that when one side of the joint starts to wear away more than the other side, <clears throat> uh, your leg actually becomes either more bow-legged or actually becomes knock-kneed. And there are many different types of arthritis. By far, the most common type of arthritis is osteoarthritis, which is known as wear and tear arthritis, where kind of like the treads of a tire. The more you drive your car, the faster the tire wears away. The more you walk, the, the, <coughs> the type of activities that you do, it can lead to wear, wearing down of the cartilage in your knees. <clears throat> Although that's the most common, um, there are other types of arthritis or other causes of arthritis that are equally important. The, most, the second most important thing, I think, is uh, inflammatory arthropathies, which is associated to, with either rheumatoid arthritis or uh, uh, crystal deposition arthritis or other type of inflammatory arthritis. It's important to distinguish the two because the treatment can be different. You know, wear and tear arthritis is usually just treating the symptoms and maybe eliminating the cause. But the other inflammatory arthropathy, if you have that type of arthritis, it may be important to actually take medicines to maybe slow the process down. Um, the other less common cause would be post-traumatic, uh, like after an injury, after a fracture, uh, post-infectious, like after an infection, 
or uh, post-procedural after a particular surgery, or if you have extensive bleeding, if you have some type of bleeding disorder, that can cause that as well. Osteoarthritis is obviously a very big problem in the United States. Um, overall, it affects about 10% of the population. Uh, in 2005, it affects more than, oops, estimated that it affects more than 27 million people, up from 20, 21 million in 1990. Uh, usually about, in, in, depending on what you read, uh, as much as 50% of adults over the age of 65 have some form of arthritis. That doesn't mean that 50% of the people complain about symptoms from it, but if you were to look at x-rays and look at more sort of objective findings, they are real, uh, affected in some way. And this is a big problem because as we know, the population um, you know, is aging in some regards. Uh, that's partially due to the, you know, the emphasis we place on health, the advancement of health care. People are living longer, better, more useful lives. You can see here that the trend over the next 10, 20, 30 years is that more and more of the population will be made up of people who are living longer and longer. So this is a really big problem for the medical pro the community, but also from a society as a whole. Because as you see, as people get older and you know, are still more functional, arthritis becomes more of a, uh, a problem and it can cause significant disability, especially with work productivity and also lifestyle. Um, people have looked at the type of problems that uh, arthritis can cause. Um, people have said one in five uh, people can, uh, uh, this one in five uh, leading cause of disability in adults is secondary to some form of arthropathy. Uh, it can affect ADLs, personal care, or even just routine uh, daily activities. You can see here arthritis can also lead to decrease in activity level. People who have arthritis have, have been shown to have, uh, uh, you know, are more shown to be more inactive than people that, who do not have arthritis, if you can imagine. So there are many risk factors, right? Probably the, the common ones would be obesity, obviously. Like I said, it's a wear and tear problem. If I have a set of tires and I put in a little mini Cooper, it'll probably wear away a lot slower than if I put the same set of tires on a big 16-wheel truck. So obviously the, the weight's an issue. Um, injury can be an issue, so you have to try to maybe prevent uh, certain injuries. Uh, it could be an occupational hazard if you do certain, uh, certain jobs that put a lot of stress on your knees. Um, other factors include age, gender, genetic predisposition, and also ethnicity, but that is not as well um, studied. Uh, one of the cures for this type of problem is total joint replacements, which is the focus of this talk. Uh, it is actually one of the more uh, common surgeries that we do in orthopedics. Uh, we do approximately around 600 total joints per year in the United States. That's more than one per minute, uh, and that number is only going to grow in the next couple of years. Uh, because of that, there's a really strong emphasis in the medical community, especially in the orthopedic community, to try to treat the, uh, this condition, either with or without surgery. So we're coming up with um, interesting ways to try to help with the symptoms associated with arthritis, uh, usually related to either injections, like um, hyaluronic acid, PRP, uh, people always ask me about stem cells, about how effective it is. Um, then there's also non-joint sort of joint replacement ways to try to help uh, repair or replace the cartilage that's been worn down, either through cartilage transplant procedures or um, uh, either through either not total joint replacements or maybe half joint replacements, and I'll touch upon that in a little bit. <clears throat> so, you know, part of the, 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 the strategies for success in terms of treating the symptoms and trying to beat the disease would be, I think the first part is prevention. Identifying the risk, identifying, uh, implementing a strategy to try to see if we can slow the progression down. And if not, then we need to recognize the disease earlier, uh, try to treat the symptoms earlier, and you know, go through the whole series of non-operative measures to try to control your symptoms before we lead to a trauma replacement. The goals of treatment obviously is to, to provide pain control, uh, improve function, improve quality of life, um, as well as allowing you to go back to the activities that you want to do. Uh, Non-surgical measures, although we're all, you know, myself, uh, I'm a surgeon, I tell all my patients that, you know, obviously it's always a last resort, so we always go through a series of non-surgical ways to see if we can help you with manage your pain, uh, manage your symptoms uh, before we go to the, the, the step of surgery. Uh, weight control is a big portion of it. Uh, cane use, which is one of the hardest things for me to convince people to use. 
uh, bracing and exercise can all help uh, offload your knee to try to decrease the stress and to hopefully decrease the symptoms in your joint. Medications can be helpful, whether over-the-counter anti-inflammatories, Tylenol, uh, Motrin, Aleve, or um, prescription medicines like Celebrex and Mobic can be helpful, but we do have to be careful because it's not something that we need to be taking on a regular basis consistently because it does have long-term effects. Uh, injections is another modality that I frequently use uh, for patients to deal with their symptoms. Um, there are cortisone injections, uh, which is like a, an anti-inflammatory directed injected directly into the knee. That can give you short-term relief. Hyaluronic acid is another type of injection. I tell people it's more like a lubrication uh, for the knee, and that can give you symptomatic relief, um, as well as other more alternatives like acupuncture, herbal medicines, and stuff like that. I tell people, though, all these things can help your symptoms, but they're all temporary. Uh, and part of it is because the underlying cause is the wear and tear of the car cartilage, and in none of those things does it really address the underlying issue, which is the cartilage that's lost. There are non sort of joint replacement options to try to help <coughs> with, the, with the disease. Uh, arthroscopy is one that people frequently bring up. Arthroscopy in itself is a very good option to treat certain things, um, but to treat arthritis, it's not as... Uh, predictable and partially because during the arthroscopy we can remove loose bodies we can shave down you know inflammation but it, we don't there's nothing we can do to kind of build that cartilage back up so although it's a useful adjunct um, you have to be careful to see exactly what um, we are targeting with the arthroscope uh, in certain people when the deformity is really bad and in young people that maybe a joint replacement is not an option we can do realignment osteotomies where we can actually look at the alignment of the leg and try to fix the alignment by, uh, by reconstructing um, the bone so that it's more straight and allows them to kind of um, offload the, the pressure in one part of the knee so it doesn't wear away as fast. Um, more and more literature is coming out on cartilage restoration, whether it's taking cartilage from yourself, taking cartilage off the shelf from a company that makes them, or taking cartilage uh, from a cadaver assessment. I think those are all good options uh, for very focal lesions, but it's not for everyone. Okay. Uh, obviously, meniscus can, uh, if in a young person where the meniscus uh, is torn and that was taken out from a previous surgery, if that's the underlying cause, we can also do stuff for that as well. Okay. Uh, the options, you know, if all those things fail and we do have to turn to arthroplasty, we do have two kind of newer options that are very promising in, in the right people. One would be a resurfacing, where if the entire joint is not very worn away and only focal areas are worn away, we have the ability to now to just target those focal areas so we can replace uh, the cartilage in one specific area as opposed to having to replace the entire joint. Um, there's uni replacements, which if you remember from the beginning, I said the knee joint has three compartments. So if only one compartment is affected, you don't need a full knee replacement, but you can actually replace just one part of the knee. And lastly, uh, total joint replacement. That is by far probably the most predictable way to obviously help uh, with the arthritis. It's the, the method that we uh, have used the longest and have the best results in terms of long-term outcomes. Um, a couple years ago, in 2008, um, our academy actually put out a publication on sort of the way we treat arthritis and what's the evidence behind it. Um, it's, it was developed by a, a knee work group and had 22 specific recommendations in eight categories. Um, they looked at all studies in our orthopedic literature and they graded them into A, B, C, where A, provide good um, evidence, B, provide fair evidence, and C, was kind of poor quality. And there was a uh, last category, which was inconclusive, where we couldn't tell whether it was good or bad. Uh, there was not enough data to kind of make a conclusion. So, in terms of treatment for arthritis, the only two things that was listed as category A, which meant good evidence, was weight loss and low impact sort of fitness exercises. Category B include patient um, education programs, activity modification, as well as quadricep strengthening, patella taping, and intraarticular steroid injections. And then in terms of grade C, which was poor evidence, was regular patient-physician contact, range of motion exercises, arthroscopy, uh, as well as realignment osteotomies. 
and then they had very specific regulations um, that were against uh, the treatment of uh, arthritis. And grade A here was oral glucosamine and chondroitin, which is probably one of the most common questions I get in the office. Should I be taking these supplements? Uh, as well as arthroscopy for arthritis. And I mentioned uh, that briefly there. All right. I'm sorry, so that, that is saying that you should not take the glucosamine and chondroitin? There's no good evidence that shows that it works. That being said, I tell a lot of my patients that Part of it, and I'll, I'll explain to it uh, a little later after the talk, is there's not a lot of good uh, control over the glucosamine chondroitin because it's not, it's not a medication. So there's no governing body that controls. I can go home, put some pills in a bag or a box or a bottle, and call it chondroitin and glucosamine, and sell at the nearby store, a GNC, grocery store, Walmart. No one can say anything because it's not very well controlled. And if you ever looked at two bottles of chondroitin or glucosamine, the, the dosing is different, the way it's made is different, there's no um, standardized way of kind of packaging it. Because of that, it's not listed as a medication, it's listed as a supplement. All right? But that being said, there I have tons of patients that come in and say they take it and they feel better. So I tell them, who am I to tell you to not take it if it makes you feel better? Um, just because... There's no science that I can quote to prove it, and if it helps you, then you should take it, is my, is my usual stance. Um, and then the inconclusive portion of it involves hyaluronic acid injections, tibial tuberculosis, acupuncture, and bracing. So my algorithm for treating arthritis in the, in the office is, uh, is this. Um, when people come in and they, have, and they get diagnosed with arthritis, depending on how their symptoms are, how bad the level of arthritis is, I usually start off with non-surgical measures, do physical therapy, anti-inflammatories. We see how they do. If they respond well, then that's great. I tell you, continue the anti-inflammatories if you need it. Do the home exercises. Um, and if it flares up, we can treat it again. If they don't respond, then we start talking about injections. I give them a choice between the cortisone injection versus the lubrication injection. Sometimes we try one, sometimes we try the other. Sometimes we try both. And if, again, if it helps them, that's great. We can get them through this episode and then we can readdress. Like I said, none of these things cure the problem. They, they merely help the symptoms. And if it flares up again, we can treat them again. If the injections don't work, then we start looking at more invasive kind of options, such as surgery. And most of the time, the wear and tear is usually in multiple areas, and most of the time it ends up being a discussion about total knee replacement. And on that note, I'm going to have my partner, Dr. Tarasari, talk about total knee replacements. Okay. <coughs> All right, thank you, Tony. That was a great talk. Uh, I just want to introduce myself. I'm partners with Dr. Tony Quach. Uh, my name is Adi Tarasari. I uh, did some subspecialty training uh, after uh, doing my uh, training in orthopedic surgery, focusing on, focusing on joint replacements. And uh, I'm uh, currently with Dr. Quach and his group, uh, helping to take care of patients with uh, hip and knee arthritis. Thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to give this talk today. So briefly, uh, my talk, we're gonna uh, overgo uh, what exactly a knee replacement involves. I also wanna touch upon who's indicated for a total knee replacement, uh, what makes someone a good candidate for a knee replacement, <coughs> We're also going to go over the expectations that patients have uh, before the surgery and also some of the risk. And I'm going to touch briefly on the recovery uh, following this uh, type of procedure. And I know we have an excellent talk coming up uh, focusing on uh, recovery after uh, joint replacement as well. So I won't uh, uh, go too much into that. So uh, just some uh, basic anatomy that uh, Dr. Quach already mentioned. Uh, the anatomy of the knee, it's a uh, hinge uh, type joint mainly. Uh, there are some uh, sliding and rotation uh, movements. Uh, the main bones are the femur, the tibia, and the uh, patella. So just uh, again, uh, a little bit of overview of what Dr. Quattro already talked about, knee arthritis. Uh, we have a healthy joint space a lot of times when you go, into, uh, go to see your doctor and you complain of knee pain. They'll take an x-ray of your knee and they'll look to see if there's space between the two bones. Uh, that's what we refer to as a joint space. So obviously you can see uh, uh, the picture on your left, which shows healthy joint space, and then you can see the bones touching, a term that uh, surgeons use quite often is bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. Uh, you may know someone who has that or 
have been told that you have that. And that's what we mean when we see both of those bones touching and you don't see any joint space. Before and after. So that's, this is what I do. Uh, I take someone who looks, uh, has an x-ray that, uh, that you see on the left and uh, give them a knee replacement. And I'm going to spend some time talking to you uh, what that entails, what you can expect from that, what to watch out for. Uh, another before and after picture, you see this patient uh, with a, a deformity, like Dr. Quach mentioned, uh, a bowing in of the leg. Uh, you can see people who, who are bow-legged or knock-kneed. And uh, a lot of that has, uh, goes along with arthritis. When one part of our knee uh, tends to deteriorate, we tend to ha get a deformity. And uh, on our right, we see what a knee looks like after an operation. You, uh, there's an uh, incision uh, right down the middle of the knee, and you can see that the leg has been straightened out and there isn't a bow, uh, uh, bowing out deformity. So the steps to a total knee replacement procedure, uh, just uh, uh, very briefly, uh, there's four steps. Uh, there's multiple steps, but you can think of them in, in four broad categories. Uh, the first category is we prepare the bone. Uh, the second category is we position the metal implants. Uh, then we resurface the kneecap, and then we insert a plastic spacer. So you can see Okay. Is the laser working? Yeah. Okay, great. Perfect. So over here, you can see that there's a, a metal uh, a portion here. There's a, there's a metal uh, uh, implant over here. And in between, uh, you can see this white material. And that's the plastic. And I'll go over that a little bit more. <coughs> I, I like to tell my patient, now, this, is not a, this is not a knee replacement. This is uh, someone who has a, a cap in their mouth. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a typo. But I like to explain to patients, uh, a knee replacement is kind of like uh, putting a crown on your tooth. You don't take the entire tooth out, you just sort of burr away the diseased tooth and you put a cap over it. And that's kind of like, uh, kind of like what we do with a knee replacement. Uh, you know, before, before I went into uh, residency, I thought a knee replacement was you do a chop here, a chop here, throw the, throw the knee away in the trash can and put, put a hinge in, you know? That's what I thought. And uh, so that's, that's clear, you know, uh, the modern knee replacement is not that. It's more of a resurfacing type uh, procedure. And uh, let's find out what exactly it is. So again, uh, another uh, cartoon depicting the uh, different uh, implants. Again, uh, a metal component that goes on the end of your femur, uh, another uh, metal component that goes on your shin bone or your tibia, and then you've got that uh, plastic spacer. And uh, again, this is the kneecap, and uh, it gets resurfaced uh, with a uh, plastic button. So uh, again, I mentioned one of the steps is uh, preparing the bone. Uh, what we actually do is we just shave off a few, uh, less than half an inch, less than half an inch, less than half an inch uh, of bone. And uh, that's part of our resurfacing uh, portion of the uh, uh, procedure. We take away the bone that has arthritis on it. And I had a patient one time, he asked me, uh, Doc, can you give me all the bone that you, that you cut out of my knee? And uh, so we're like, oh, okay, fine, it's a weird request. Uh, we gave it to him, and, and he said, what is this? It looks like wood shavings. He was a carpenter. He's like, it looks like, you know, someone's working on my cabinets. And that's actually what it looks like. You know, it's not, uh, it's not some drastic uh, a cut where, you know, half your knee's missing. It's just, it's just a few millimeters uh, of bone that we shaved down. Uh, and then the next step is uh, putting the metal implants in. So we've uh, cut the bone. Uh, we got our wood shavings out. And then uh, we put uh, the caps on the end of the bones. And then again, uh, we got the plastic spacer, uh, as you see, is, is that white material. And uh, that becomes important uh, when patients ask us, well, how long is this knee gonna last? So what really wears out is the plastic spacer. The metal doesn't, uh, doesn't wear out. But over time, if, if you live long enough, if you walk long enough, you will at some point wear out that plastic spacer. So a lot of patients uh, come into the office. Uh, they've done all the things that Dr. Quach uh, has told them. They've, they've, uh, they've lost weight. Uh, they've put a brace on. They, they began a walking program. They, they've taken ibuprofen, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, they're, they're coming down that road, and uh, they're afraid of a knee replacement. They ask me, should I get a knee replacement? Do you think I should get a knee replacement? And uh, what I tell them, you know, is, is your pain bad enough to, to where it stops you from doing things that you like doing? Did, did you not? Did, did you uh, stay at home and not go to Disney World with your kids because, because of your knee? Did, did you skip out on a trip because of your knee? You know, when the answer starts becoming yes, then it's yes, it's, it's time to start thinking about a knee replacement. Um, and again, uh, the first steps are all the steps that Dr. Quach highlighted. Um, so 
once you have the arthritis, doesn't automatically mean you go to a knee replacement. It means that you start taking steps to improve your symptoms. And sometimes uh, if, if you lose some weight, and you, you could be good for several years. Sometimes you could do everything right and you still have a lot of pain. So the next step is uh, go see your orthopedic surgeon, uh, hopefully me or Dr. Quach. Um, go in and uh, get a medical history. Uh, we tell, find out, uh, you know, get a full history. Uh, it's not just your knee, uh, you know, other problems that you have. Uh, do a thorough physical examination, uh, take some x-rays to look at if you have any deformity, uh, what kind of uh, disease uh, you have going on inside your knee. And uh, I also ask patients if they are going to have a knee, and sort of start thinking about what, what to do after uh, in the recovery process. Um, the other, uh, the other uh, thing uh, that I uh, spent a lot of time counseling patients on is their expectations. You know, is, is the knee going to allow you to, uh, you know, uh, go back to your glory days? Probably not. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's going to, but it is going to give you pain-free um, uh, uh, function for the vast majority of things that people like to do. So uh, there's, and there's certain things that people can't do despite a, despite a perfect uh, knee replacement. But half the people we found out that they, they, they have very uh, hard time kneeling. So if you're a big gardener. I say, look, well, you might not be able to kneel. We, everything could go perfect, but you might not be able to go down on your knees. For some people, that's important, you know, whether or not, you know, if you're, if you're into certain types of exercises or some people, when they pray, they, they, they go down on their knees or some, certain cultures. So I always counsel patients on that. So that's, you know, uh, it's, very, it's uh, very good to have uh, your expectations in line with reality. So, you know, what, what, can, what can we realistically expect from a total knee replacement? Of course, you can go back and, and walk. Uh, you, can, you can do low impact activities such as uh, swimming, biking, uh, play golf. Uh, those are all uh, very reasonable activities that the vast majority of patients go back to. And we know from data, uh, we've been putting knees in for over 30 years, we as, a, as the orthopedic community in general, um, and uh, we know that uh, over 90% of patients uh, at 15 years out from their knee replacement surgery are doing very well and able to enjoy all their uh, activities. So what can go wrong, right? It's always good to know what, what the risks are. It's always good to know what you're getting into. And I always go over this with my patients as well. Uh, the number one uh, most devastating complication is infection. Anytime you put a foreign uh, material into the body, there can be infection. Uh, the cha uh, nationwide, the risk is less than 2%. Uh, so it doesn't happen all the time, but it's, it's rare. But when it happens, it's a bad deal. Uh, there are certain patients who are more at risk for infection than other patients. Uh, patients who have uh, rheumatoid, patients who have been on steroids for a long time. If you have, you know, uh, certain, certain medical conditions can put you at higher risk for infection. But again, uh, we take uh, great caution to prevent infection. The other uh, uh, complication that can occur is blood clots uh, after surgery. It typically happens uh, a few weeks after surgery. All our patients, uh, uh, all of uh, Dr. Quach's patients and my, my patients uh, go on uh, a preventative medication to uh, prevent blood clots. And the more you walk and the more active you are, the less likely your chance of developing blood clots. Also with uh, total knee replacement, uh, if someone is not um, uh, working uh, diligently with physical therapy, then uh, there's a risk of uh, stiffness and we'll touch upon that in the next talk. And uh, again, if uh, you're very active and uh, let's say you get a total knee replacement and you begin running marathons, then eventually that knee's going to wear out much quicker than someone who just goes uh, and uh, goes out for a stroll every now and then. So again, your activity level uh, can also put you at risk. So this is not the recovery. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> but uh, some, of the, some of the main goals uh, following knee replacement. Uh, so I'd like to break it down into uh, what you can expect while you're in the hospital and what you can expect when you get out of the hospital. So in the hospital, you have to keep your pain under control. Uh, so our patients get uh, multiple pain medications and they're very comfortable. That being said, you're going to be a little sore because it is a major operation. Bone, muscle, tendon were, were cut and sewn together. So, uh, But we do have uh, uh, several uh, uh, modalities at our disposal to control pain. Again, preventing blood clots, which I touched upon, uh, preventing pneumonia. Uh, the vast majority of patients uh, don't undergo general anesthesia, so pneumonia is uh, not that much of a risk. 
Uh, and again, physical therapy uh, is started on uh, sometimes a day of surgery uh, and uh, every single time, day after surgery, you're up and out of bed and uh, walking with assistance. What can you expect at home? So at home, you want to uh, keep a good eye on the wound, make sure that uh, it's not red, it's not green, etc. So those are things that I uh, ask uh, patients to watch out for. And again, that's uh, and when you, once you go home, that's when we really ratchet up the physical therapy. And uh, we're going to have another talk uh, focusing on that. And I like to tell patients that it can take up to 9 to 12 months to get the full benefit of your total knee replacement. It's not uh, snap your fingers and why am I not better. Uh, it takes a long time, but everyone... Uh, who undergoes it, who has a good outcome, will tell you that little by little, the further they get away from surgery, the better they feel. And, um, you know, our studies should show anywhere uh, from a year beyond, people are still making small incremental uh, improvements. And uh, with that, uh, I'm going to stop here and uh, give up to Danik uh, for uh, some of the rehab uh, portion uh, following total new replacements. Thank you very much. Just a lot of seconds. Start it, start the camera.